mentioned last week, we started our series on the end times. We're continuing today, and we're going to kind of wrap things up. More than likely, next week, we're going to get into a lot more of the technical issues to give you a broad spectrum of what we believe. And I've told you already, I am not one of these pastors that has everything figured out when it comes to the end times. I'll make that very clear to you. I, I, I give a lot of grace to people who have different views, especially if they believe that Jesus is the Lord. He rose again from the dead, right? They believe that. They believe the Bible is the word of God, and they believe he's going to come back. They believe in heaven and hell. That's the main stuff, but the in-between stuff is still important to know. But we mentioned how last week can get kind of confusing, and sometimes people think we're crazy. For example, I remember hearing about these two pastors that were alongside the road, and they had these signs saying, turn, turn now before it's too late. One pastor had that. The other pastor had another sign that says, the end is near. And, and this car drives by and says, you religious nuts, bah, bah, bah. He honks at him and gives him some sign language. Of course, we don't want to say what the sign language was. But all of a sudden, they heard, and, the, and they saw that the car went into the water, and one pastor said to the other, you think we should have put a sign, bridges out? <laughs> all right, I worked that one really hard. Okay. <laughs> But sometimes we speak in a way that the world doesn't understand what we're talking about. The end is near. Bridge is out, right? We should explain to people that what we see going on in our, on our world today are signs of the end times. And, and often we've spoken too much about it. Last week I went into that. There's a lot of talk about this, and we're going to get into it in a few moments. But as we do that, let's get to the words of Jesus. Very important because Jesus it lays out what's essential, what is absolutely, positively essential. These are the things you need to have. Jesus tells us to get ready. How many like preppers, right? There's people that are preppers out there. You guys, some of you still have stuff from Y2K in your basement, <laughs> right? Prepping for the next year, what's going to happen. You know, sometimes it's good to have an emergency kit, have a backpack, which you have like the essentials, right? Have a flashlight. Make sure you change the batteries. Have basic essentials. If something were to happen, if there was a power outage, like, like the crazy stuff that happened yesterday, aren't you glad? Who was in the airport yesterday? Oh, you poor thing. How was it? Yeah. So if you know what happened, the entire system went out in the Microsoft and it was complete, bed, uh, complete chaos, right? So, you know, have ourselves ready in case something happens. We have the essentials, that any moment we can pick it up and leave. And we have to recognize that we should be thinking about our lives like that. What are the essentials that I cannot live without and what is no big deal? And so, my friends, what's really important is your relationship with Jesus Christ. How are you with God? All right? Are you a good relationship with him? These are things that are important and you need to know what's going to happen at the end times. Because if you don't, what happens, you become a reactor instead of a responder. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed this. It's not a political statement. This is just an observation. Have you noticed that the Secret Service was reacting, not responding last week? They were buffooned. I mean, they didn't know what they were doing, right? They were reacting. But a trained Secret Service person is respond because they practice. They know what to do immediately. They know what to do. You don't have to sit there wondering and fumbling and bumbling saying, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Can't even get your gun in the holster, and you're walking around, and I mean, it's just ridiculous how, and letting what happened happen. That is an example of not being ready and, and reacting instead of responding. We could have lost a president, a former president. It could have been devastating for our country, right? And so that's, that's, an, that's an example of not being ready when things happen. Because no one knows. I mean, it's almost like that. You, you don't think someone's going to shoot somebody at a, at a, at a at a political event, but you got to be ready. You don't know what's going to happen. So you and I need to be ready because you don't know when Christ is going to come back. So we don't want to be mumbling and bumbling and stumbling, not knowing how to handle ourselves and looking like fools. We should be ready because we're prepared. Now, the only way you get prepared is you have to know the basic information that is essential, think about it, and even, even begin to play out the scenarios in your head so when something happens, there's muscle memory, there's spiritual memory that you know how to respond and you're not going to be freaking out like everyone else. Does that make sense? 
okay? So you know what to do. So we want to respond, not react. That's why we're studying the end times. And Jesus tells us the absolute essentials so you and I can respond. The other minutia of details is not nearly as important, though it is helpful, but it's not essential. God wants us to have that pack, that backpack ready. And some of you want to have a semi-truck full of your end time theology, and it's not all that's kind of fine and wonderful, but what you really need is the backpack with the essentials. And the essentials is he's coming back at an hour we do not know. The essentials that you're going to have to face God one day and give an account for your life. The essentials is there's a place called heaven and a place called hell. And, and you may not like that. I don't like hell. Well, why is it then when you see something wrong, you want retribution? Why is it you want justice? Because you're made in the image of God, and you know instinctively there has to be payment for sin, and we have to get rid of this stuff in our world because it's destroying it, right? So you know that instinctively, and God loves us, and he has a plan for us, and if you're alive, he has a plan for you. So what we want to be able to do is have that backpack of essentials. It's okay to have the, the trailer as well with other stuff, but we have to have the essentials because that's what you need, including the little straw we can drink out of puddle, puddles. You ever try one of those things? I won't try one. Someone bought me one. It's like a straw you can like go through like a side of the road and drink out of it. It has a filter on it. Anyhow, preppers. Okay, I also have some freeze-fried I, I, listen, if you guys can get any Pepe's, powdered Pepe's, or Sally's pizza, I'll give it a shot, okay? I like pizza. All right. What does it have to do with the sermon? Nothing. Just getting you a little hungry. Okay, so they asked him. The disciples are hanging out with Jesus. And so what happened is there was a construction project in Jerusalem where for 40 to 7 to 48 years, the Romans under Herod was rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem because if you're not familiar what happened, Israel used to have their own nation. They eventually were taken over by the Babylonians and then the Persians, and then eventually Rome took over, and they wanted to bring peace, and so they actually rebuilt the temple for the Jewish people. It was like a 47-year construction project. It was beautiful. It was limestone. They had the temple there. They had the walls. It was gorgeous, and as they're building it, they're still building it while Jesus and the disciples are around, so they're probably kind of walking around some scaffolding and seeing some workers, and the disciples are pointing, look at this, Jesus. Isn't this amazing? Isn't this beautiful? And then Jesus puts them in their place and says the following. He says, you see all these things? They're going to be torn down. Like, what? What are you talking about, Jesus? And so Jesus begins to talk to his disciples what's going to happen. We're going to get into a few moments. But before we do that, I, I want to bring two primary, uh, three or four verses that are absolutely important to organize all the end times and put them in the proper perspective. These are foundational end times um, understandings that we need to have or everything else is going to be out of order. It's the foundation of the end times. All the other stuff is built upon these things. Does that make sense? Okay, what I'm saying? Hopefully. If it doesn't, tell me after the service and oh well. Okay, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Okay, that's what they wanted. They wanted Jesus to restore the kingdom. Why? There's prophecies uh, for over a thousand years that I'm going to come. God's going to restore his kingdom, right? He's going to restore for hundreds of years. He's going to restore the monarchy again. And that, that David is going to be, the line of David will continue. They're going to have their nation again. They're going to have all these things. Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus, at this point, rose again from the dead, okay? He, amazing. He spent 40 days on earth. Over 500 people saw him. And they're like, okay, Jesus, are you going to restore the kingdom? You think by this point they would get the notice what's going on, but they don't know yet. He said to them, it's not for you to what? Know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed in his own authority. They want to know, like you and I want to know, right? And sometimes there'll be some guy on television. You send me $1,000, I'm going to send you a special, a special binocular so you can see the end times. Just call quickly. We, we, operas are standing by, right? And so people will tell you these things, and we go after it because we want the special knowledge. But what does God say? He says to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority, but, but you will receive 
power, dunamis, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, they were looking. So let me explain what he was saying. It's not for you to know the times and the seasons, but I want you to have your backpack ready. What do you need to know? You need the power and the work of the Holy Spirit in your life to go through these times. Again, we've been reading through the Bible in a year. We just got through Romans 7 where the apostle Paul says, what I want to do, I don't do. And what I hate, I do do. What, what will help me get through this? And, and basically, he says, thanks be to God. Uh, and he talks again later on. The apostle Paul says, how do we navigate these difficulties is we learn to walk by the Spirit, not the flesh. So we need the Holy Spirit to navigate in these uncharted times. Jesus says, I am the way, truth, and the life. I like to say, Jesus says, I am the ways. You know what ways is, right, everybody? You, know? you don't know what ways is? Oh, it's amazing. It, I love ways. You don't need a radar detector anymore if you have ways. Why would you need a radar detector? I call it a prayer, a prayer alert. So when it goes off, you pray for the police, that God would bless them, that, they're, you know, that their radar guns would not work and that their optics will not work. But anyhow, so now we have something called Waze, and Waze is fantastic because it's real-time GPS, right? And so what happens is I need, I need to know what's going on, and so the Holy Spirit is like that Waze. He shows you what's going to happen in real time, and you need to be attuned to that. You're going to make sure that thing is on and on your Android Play or your Apple Play. You want to make sure it's on the dashboard. You want to make sure you have it in there. So when something happens, I don't know if you know what happens with Waze, it will tell you um, obstacle ahead. The other day, I thank God, I said obstacle ahead, something on the road. And sure enough, there was this, like, a, like an old tire on the road. I could have hit it, so I saved myself. One time it says animal on the road. I'm looking like, where's this animal? It was like a little squirrel on the side of the road. <laughs> Do me a favor, is this a squirrel? Don't put it on the thing. Okay, if there's a hippo hippopotamus or a deer or an antelope play, if there's a home on the range, okay, put it on there. Anyhow, so with this GPS tells you what you do, right? You need to be in tune with the Holy Spirit, okay? We need to walk by the Spirit, not the flesh. Now, that's a whole other thing we're going to get into in September as we go through the book of 1 Corinthians. So, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You'll be my witnesses. Witness simply means you're going to be showing people how to do something right. You're going to be showing people, you're going to be showing and telling first, well, often we tell, don't show. God wants us to what? Show and then tell. So you are a show and tell at work, in the garage, at your office, in the dental office, in the doctor's office, wherever God sends you, you are called to be his witnesses. We have a purpose. We're supposed to spread the good news through our actions and through our words. You mean my witnesses in Jerusalem? Jerusalem is your local area. What should be Cheshire, right? Prospect, Bethany, Hamden, Middlebury, Noberry, Whosbury, Whatbury, I don't care, Berry, or Blackberry. Do they still make Blackberries? Okay. Do you know how you get a Bluetooth? You bite into a Blackberry. By the way, do they still have blackberries? I don't think they have blackberries anymore. Okay. Oh, they do? Okay. All right. What does it have to do? Nothing. Okay. Okay. But be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and Samaria, the people that you don't like, and the other parts of the world. So you and I are supposed to have an effect, supposed to spread the kingdom of God wherever we go. Okay? And so that's what we're to do. We're to be the salt and light. Doesn't mean you have to go around and and preach to people, you live your life and you share your faith. And how do you do that? It's just a side note, not part of the message, but I just wanted to say it for a few moments. When you find a good restaurant, what do you do? You tell people about it, right? Well, when you have a relationship with Christ and it's vibrant, you tell people about it. Hey, listen, let me tell you about this pizza, right? Let me tell you about Jesus. Now, why did you equate pizza with Jesus? Because both are good. Okay, but anyway, God, Jesus is better. But seriously, you, you talk about restaurants, right? You talk about a movie you saw or a play you saw or something like that, and, and you're excited about it. So if you're living in the Spirit, you should be sharing your faith and making a difference in the world. See, in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the ends of the earth, and when he had said these things, they were looking 
on. He was lifted up on a cloud and took him out of sight. He was on the mount called Mount of Olives. We mentioned it last week. God, Jesus ascended into heaven. We're not quite sure exactly what happened. The disciples are like, they're just sitting there with their mouths open. And what does the angel say? He said, men of Galilee, why are you standing or looking into the heaven? We often do that. We want to see the end times and look at our Bibles and say, try to figure it out. It's good to study. But sometimes it's like, get to work, right? It's not time to look. It's time to act. And so, you see, we can get busy trying to look at all these end times and trying to fit it all together. And I'm not saying it's wrong. But it's okay, but that cannot be your main thing. You need to listen to the Holy Spirit, which is your ways, which will help you navigate whatever you go through. It even says the Holy Spirit will tell you what to speak when you're being persecuted. He'll show you what to do. Then Jesus, who was taken up from you in the heaven, he'll come back the same way as you saw him go to heaven. So Jesus, how is he going to come back? On the Mount of Olives. And people are going to see him. No secret Jesus is in Olathe, Kansas, or something like that, that people believe in Missouri or whatever. He is not going to come in western New York. He's going to be back in Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives. The Bible is very clear about that. He's also going to come in an unmistakable way that every eye will see him, which we'll get in a few moments. Now, before Jesus died and went to the cross, he also told his disciples this. Are you ready? So it's not for you to know the times of the season that God has put in place, but you are to spread the gospel throughout the world. Be my witnesses, right? That's essential. Here's another essential one. You ready? Okay. I know I mentioned it last week. This is like so foundational. But concerning that day and hour, what does it say? No one knows. Not even the angels, nor the man in Texas, nor the angels of heaven, nor the sun. Nor the Father, um, but only the Father only. No one knows. Jesus at the time did not even know. So no one, why does no one know? Because it's the element of surprise. You see, it's all going to come together, but only the Father knows. So no one knows the day. No one knows the hour, but we can know the seasons. And so we need to be informed, and we need to be ready to respond and not react. This is what we're teaching this today for. So in many ways, we talked about the end times is like a big puzzle. Like we see the end times, but we're not quite sure how these pieces fit together, right? You're trying to fit, does this, is it pre-trip, mid-trip? We'll get to that next week, by the way. I seriously mean it this time, okay? And so you're trying to get the puzzle in there. If you get that puzzle and you're trying to do a puzzle and you're trying to make it fit, it looks like it's right. It reminds me when I got a battery put in a car from a local mechanic, and I said, the battery's not fitting. It took out a big hammer. I'll make it fit. Nah, that's okay. I'm going to go someplace else, right? So don't try to make it fit. You see, God's going to show us how it's put together. So the end times is like a puzzle, but God gives us enough of the puzzle. Enough, he gives us enough of the box top. It doesn't show the whole box top, but he gives us a section what we need to know. And the other parts were like, ah, we got to figure it out. It's not worth fighting over. Don't fight over pre, mid, post, A, whatever. Don't get it. Well, that's next week, but I'll, I'll get into it. Focus on the essentials. Focus on the essentials. And what's the essentials? Okay, when you die, you go to paradise, right? Second coming of Christ. There'll be a great throne of judgment for everybody. You have not in hell. That's, that's all that really matters. All the other stuff we'll get into next week. We're going to fill in the rec- next week. We're going to fill in the other things that are, are, are good to know. But these are the essential things that we have to know. And this is what the Bible is explicitly clear on. These are the straight edges on the puzzle. This is the centerpiece of the puzzle. Okay. What did Jesus say about the end of the world? As we're going to talk about this next. He said several things. Okay. And as he came out of the temple... One of his disciples said, look, teacher, what wonderful stones. Again, they're looking at the construction project, the beautiful temple. They say, look at this Jesus. And then Jesus kind of puts them in their place. He said, ah, what's the big deal? He said, no. Do do you see these great buildings? Yeah. There will not be be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And by the way, been there, seen this in Jerusalem, they did an excavation, and they find the rubble from when the Romans came in in 70 AD. What happened is they got tired of the rebellions that were coming out of the Jewish people and said, we've had it, that's enough, we're gonna wipe it out. So they basically do, they tore the temple down and they got rid of the animal sacrifices. We're gonna show you some pictures about in a few moments, but this is the rubble that was left over about the size of a car or an SUV. This is a person, this is a scale. So yeah, it, they tore it apart. 
So, Jesus, so, so the disciples hear that from Jesus. They're like, hey, tell us some more, Jesus. So that's what happened. So they sat down on the Mount of Olives, and Jesus began to describe to them what was going to happen. And as he sat down, opposite of the temple. By the way, you can see from the Mount of Olives, you can actually see the Western Gate. Peter and James and John and Andrew, tell us when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, see that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am the one. Don't believe it. Okay? And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, uh, it's going to happen. It's almost like being pregnant. You have the first trimester, the second trimester, and the third trimester. In the first trimester, you start noticing things are happening. And then the pangs begin to happen more and more and more and more. And if you've never had a baby before, you're calling the doctor every other day, right? And you're driving to the hospital so many times. Like the first time we had Luke, I was clueless. I even went to that silly class where you sit and you put a clothespin on your ear as if that's going to help me understand what my wife's going through. Lamont's class, don't waste your time. Anyhow, it's a waste of money. <laughs> Is anyone teach Lamont's here? Uh-oh. But, you know, we overreacted for everything, right? But then we, oh, okay, now it, that's a contraction. So what has happened is in the church, we've seen one thing, we think it's the end. It's not. He says, and when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. It's going to happen. Things are going to get worse before they get better, right? This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against nation. There will be earthquakes, more and more. So you're going to see a proliferation of more and more things. It's global warming. It's because of the automobile. No, 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 no. The Bible says this stuff's going to happen. Okay? I'm not talking about that, but there'll be earthquakes, solar flares that knock out our communication systems. Right? Stuff you can't control. That's even beyond what man would do. These are what? The beginnings of the birth pangs. It's not the end yet. It's not the end yet. Then they will deliver you up to be tribulation. We've seen this happen. In America, we don't see much of this. We, we got it pretty darn good. In fact, things are so good, we have a song, Who Needs Heaven in a Place Like Earth, right? Things are going awesome here. I got, my I got my retirement. I got my lake house. I got my boat. I got my ski thing. I got my 401K. I'm ready to retire at 55 and go. I'm just talking like wishful speaking. But now, so, you know, I'm all good now. I don't need heaven. I'm doing well. And so what happens is you and I, things are going so well that we become lazy. It's almost like when you're winning the game and you're like, you know, I, I played tennis before. I'm playing and I'm doing great. I'm like, ah, this, I got this. And all of a sudden the other player keeps at it and then I, I get beat because I get lazy. And if you're not careful, you and I can get lazy and sluggish because we're drunk on the things of the world like everyone else, and we're not paying attention to what's... We need to be sober-minded. We don't want to be like the secret service that doesn't know what they're doing. We want to be ready, looking, right? Looking out, scoping the room, scoping times, you know, going to the restaurant, having your back against the wall, seeing what's going on in the restaurant. You know, I mean, that's what they do. They scope, they look, they're very aware of what's going on. You and I need to be like that. We need to be ready, not paranoid, but ready. They will fall away and betray each other. And so one of the things about biblical prophecy is this. You, for example, let's suppose this is Daniel, who's the book of Daniel, and he sees a desolation, and he sees the temple and the sacrilege things taking place. He sees it happen in his time. Then he sees it happen in 70 AD, and then maybe he sees it in the third temple. We don't know. So what happens is even Jesus, he's talking about these things, but in these valleys are thousands or hundreds of years. And so when we read these things in the Bible, we're like, what is Jesus talking about? It's almost like Jesus has an alt tab while he's talking to his disciples, changing screens. Present time, 70 AD, end of the age. He's going back and forth, like what? And so I don't think, uh, if this is why there's dispute and uh, different views on this. By the way, those disputes and different views are minor and don't really matter in the long scope of things if they're focusing on the absolutes. Does that make sense, everybody? So Jesus would talk about. So for example, you have the sacrilege that took place in the temple in Daniel's time, and then you'll have it later on. So you hear these things happening. But this is what he says, and this is very important. But not a hair on your head will perish. I don't know what's happened to me. I've lost a lot of hairs on my head. <laughs> but your endurance, you will gain your lives. But when you see Jerusalem 
surrounded by armies, then know that the desolation has come near. They, he's telling them, hey, guys, this is going to happen in your lifetime. And by the way, it did happen. It did happen. Then that those who are in Judah flew to the, uh, flee to the mountains. These are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Talks about women. Hope you're not pregnant during this time because it's going to be a rough time. And by the way, this stuff happens. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive upon all nations. Now, this is what happened. In 70 AD, what happened is the, the Romans came in and they tore the temple apart and knocked Jerusalem all out and scattered the Jews. There was an arch of Titus that was built in 82 AD. And in this arch, what the Roman people used to do back in those days, when they had a great victories, they would have these arches and put all their battles in here. And they literally have, by the way, this is what it looks like, they literally show when they sacked Jerusalem in 70 AD. They took the menorah, they took all the articles, they actually showed it. We had enough. Why? Because you go there, it's like your internet back in those days. That's how you, that's how you see with the news. You go to these arches and you see art, the arch and you see the artwork that actually explains the conquest that Rome had. And so here you see what happened. Now what happened is they came in and they burned it down. They burned it down they tore up, they tore the walls down. They, they literally had these all types of things to destroy them. And they, I mean, it was horrible. Tens of thousands of Jewish people perished during this time. It was a horrific time. It, they thought it was the end of the end. And Jesus prophesied that it would take place. Again, there's the rubble you see. I've actually been there. I've actually seen when these are Turkish war, walls made later on. But these are the original walls. Uh, the time of Christ, and they were all knocked down. I actually had a chance to walk on some steps that Jesus would have walked on. Hopefully, when things get a little cooler, we'll take a trip over again. So, so what happens? And Jerusalem will be trampled under the feet of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So when 70 AD happened, you know what happened? The animal sacrifices stopped. The Jewish people have not had animal sacrifices in Jerusalem since 70 AD. And there are people today trying to bring the wet heifer there. They're trying to rebuild. They're trying to, I'm not going to get into that today. But the bottom line is this. It says that Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now, very something very interesting. In 19, we talked about this. In 1948, what happened? Israel became a nation in one day. It says in the scriptures, can a nation become a nation in one day? And yes, it can be. And let me say something else. I'm getting a lot of pushback from people that have anti-Semitism in the church today. I'm getting letters, people coming to me. Listen, they're God's chosen people, and we're God's chosen people. Don't, there's a demonic delusion upon the church and upon Jewish people, upon people attacking Jewish people. Jesus is the only way, truth, and life. The Jewish people have to come through Jesus as well. But God loves the Jewish people, and he has a plan for them. And so this is amazing. In 1967, Israel recaptured Jerusalem. There's four quarters in Jerusalem. One quarter is the Muslim quarter. So they don't have it. They have it under their control. So some people would say, well, when they get the whole thing, then it's going to come the end. I don't know. But they have about 35 acres on top of the Temple Mount where you have something called the Dome of the Rock, which is Islamic holy space, where they believe that um, Muhammad went to heaven on a horse and came back down, and they have this dome that commemorates that right at the place where the temple, they believe, was built. So right now, they cannot put a temple up. It would be all kinds of war. It, it'd be war. Okay? So that's Jerusalem. So it says, it will be, so they got it back. They, 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 excuse me, they just don't have one quarter of the city, although they oversee it all, okay? So it could be said that the times of the Gentiles were fulfilled. That is a huge, mild marker on the prophetic timeline, all right? And because of lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. You can see that happening. That's why we need to make sure we care about people. But the one who endures to the end shall be saved. Now, this is a huge one, okay? The, one of the major ones is Jerusalem will be tread under the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. That's a big deal. Are we in that place? Then this is another huge one. I brought it up last week. I'll bring it again. This is absolutely huge, and it's ready to happen in our lifetime. It's this. And this gospel, the gospel of Jesus, 
of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, which means ethnes, all people groups, then the end will come. Some people think there's about 200 languages left in the world that don't have a gospel. Some others think 70. And now we help support ministries that make copies of the Bible to these remote places so the whole world can have a testimony. And there seems to be some sort of quota that God has, which we'll get into next week about more about that as well. So all the nations, then the end will come. It is very, very possible that the contractions are getting more because the, the gospel is going to be a testimony to the whole world. It's speeding up now like never before. We're able to do a translation within six months or less, four months because of AI. Quick, and then you just have to clean it up a little bit, you know, and do that. It's amazing what's going on. So this is happening quicker and faster and quicker and faster. And then Jesus goes on and says the following. And if those days have not been short, no human being would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days we cut short. Now, what is he talking about? He's talking about 70 AD or the end of the age? Which one is he alt, alt, tab, um, alt on? Which, which screen is Jesus on? Which mountain is he talking about? And this is what causes problems of people understanding. We don't know exactly, to be honest. We just don't know. It could be, maybe it's not. Okay? But for the sake of the elect, those days would be cut short. Then... If anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, there he is, do not believe it. Remember, false Christ will come. And by the way, to perform great signs and wonders. If someone prays for somebody and they get healed, does not mean it's from God. If someone does a miraculous sign, it doesn't mean it's from God. We cannot worship signs and wonders. We, wash, we worship God. So there's going to be a proliferation of supernatural occurrences psychic healings and talking to the dead and all this other stuff might be happening and all these, wow, I must be of God. No, just because something is supernatural does not mean it's of God. There are dark spirits and there, there are spirits of God. So there's gonna be a proliferation of the supernatural. That's why you and I need more of the power of God like Moses when he faced the false magicians of, of Egypt. They performed signs and wonders as well, but our snake ate theirs. What I don't understand is the big, the one they could not do was the fruit fly. I don't understand that. But have you noticed you can't get rid of the fruit fly? Right? I'm trying to bite a peach and this thing's flying in my eye. Okay. Can I just complain a little bit once in a while? Okay. So we perform great signs and wonders as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you what? Beforehand. Why? He wants you to respond not react, not react. And they say, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. They say, look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. When you see lightning in the sky, you, you hear the crack, you hear the thunder, right? Immediately after the tribulation of those days, tribulation is difficulty. Are we gonna go through the tribulation? Well, right now, there are people that are having tribulation. There are people whose heads been cut off. There are people who have been tortured. So yes, the stuff is happening today. What about the great tribulation? There will be great tribulation, the whole earth. And it talks about seven years. We're going to get into that next week, okay? Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. And the moon will not give its light. And the stars will fall from heaven. And the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Sounds like a nuclear winter. I don't know what's going to happen. But a tremendous thing is going to take place. Then it will appear in the heavens a sign of the Son of Man. And the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven and the power with great glory. Listen, when Jesus comes back, every eye is going to see it. And he's going to come back on the Mount of Olives. It's not like, well, no secret comebacks. The parousia of Jesus, that God is going to come back. Maybe we see it on our phones or our holograms or whatever we're going to have in the future. I don't know. But every eye will see when Christ comes back. It's going to be undeniable. Undeniable. And he'll send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. And they will gather the elect from the four corners of the world. Now, this is what Jesus says. From the fig tree, learn this lesson. See, figs, fig trees... Guess what the first leaf was that Adam and Eve used to hide their nakedness? Fig leaves. What was, G, what was often represented by Israel is the fig tree. 
Jesus saw a fig tree with leaves, but it had no fruit, and he cursed it. Because he was frustrated what Israel was not getting at the time. But listen to this. The fig tree learned its lesson as soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know the summer is near. This is the problem. We have the end times tree. No one has ever seen the end times tree. No one has ever picked the fruit from the end times tree. So we see the leaves coming out. We see the buds, but is it going to come yet? And like, for example, you know when the apples are going to come, right? Here in Connecticut. But no one has seen the tree, so we're trying to figure out, when is it going to, when is it going to happen? See? You should know that summer is near. So also, you see these things, you should know that he is near. We're going to have some signs that know. What are some signs that we know? Here's some signs. False messiahs and prophets are going to come. A proliferation, more and more and more and more. We're going to see that. We're going to see wars and rumors of wars, more and more and more. These are some signs that Christ told us. We're going to have other signs next week. Also, natural disasters are going to increase and more and more and more. It's going to get worse. It's going to get worse and worse. Persecution of believers is going to get worse. Also, it's going to happen apostasy and lawlessness. People are going to leave the faith. You're going to drive by churches, and they're going to have all sorts of things outside their church, which indicates they don't believe in the gospel. You're going to see the, the, the church becoming pagan. You're going to hear about a pastor who sleeps as a secretary, and the week later, he opens up another church down the street, and people go to it. Stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, we don't care about the gospel. We do what we want to do. And you're going to see that happen. Apostasy and lawlessness is going to happen. The church is going to fall away. It's going to get worse more and more. And Israel restored. That's a big one. That's a huge one. Big time. And the gospel to all nations. My friends, we're in that day. So my question today to you is this. Do you have that backpack ready? I want you to make sure you have the essentials in there. To have a relationship with Jesus Christ is number one. To be walking in the spirit, not the flesh. To be aware of these situations. So when it happens, you want to respond, not react. When everyone's freaking out, you have peace. So next week, we're going to give you more about what's going to happen that will help us to know when the timing has come. Let me ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes. Father, I pray that we be ready in your coming in Jesus' name. Lord, I just pray right now that you would remove fear. For we know that perfect love casts out fear. And Father, for all of us today, that we be ready. Lord, I pray that we would not be drunk on the world. That we not be like the, like the Bible talks about, the people that didn't have the oil. They didn't, we're not ready when you came. Lord, we want to make sure we're ready to roll when you come. That we are in season and ready to go. Father, I pray that every person here would have a relationship with you. Father, that we would focus on what really matters in life and not get distracted by things that don't matter. And that we be about your work. And we'd be looking for you to come and make a difference in Jesus' name.